Okay, so let's get started. Um, so today we have Anne-Marie Pepper. She comes to us from Communication Studies from uh, Northwestern Universities. Um, I actually know her work for years. I've been following her work for years. I'm really excited that she's here to give a talk today. So um, she's, uh, she also holds a uh, joint appointment at uh, Electronic Engineering and Computer Science and also Communication Science and Disorder. Her research mainly is in the HCI field. She studies natural user interface to support um, communication, learning, and social interaction across all types of lifespan. And in particular, she has studied a lot about older adults using technologies and people with dis disabilities using technologies. I do want to mention she has won numerous awards, right? She is um, a NSF Korea Award recipient. She also has won Northwestern University Curriculum Development Award, and her paper has got Best Paper Award and nomination at Kai this and many other conferences. Um, so I will leave it with you. Thank you very much. For so as you said, I direct the Inclusive Technology Lab. And my research group designs and studies interactive systems for people, regardless of age or ability, um, to participate more fully in society. And so my work spans the domains of accessible communication, technologies for learning, as well as help and therapy. So I've worked on cooperative games for children with autism, learning social skills. In other work, I've introduced multimodal displays for deaf patients to communicate with hearing physicians using speech to text. Um, transcription. And then more recently I've been working on surface haptics. So these are special custom built uh, displays that um, you can program to have uh, tactile feedback as you move your finger across. It can grip and release the finger to make it feel bumpy or slippery. So we're looking at that for um, early STEM learning as well as reading. And we've even explored wearable haptic displays and audio only interfaces for people with vision impairments. But across all of these projects, the most challenging topic I've found involves designing for the experience of aging, and that's the focus of my talk today. To help you understand why, I'll start with a story. So this is Ethel. She's 105. She has normal age-related memory loss. She often forgets people's names and her relationships to them. She's becoming socially withdrawn. She doesn't use a computer at all. This is her daughter, Alice who knows how important it is to keep her mother socially engaged and who's looking for new ways of communicating with her mother. Yet her mother won't touch an iPad and is not interested in anything that looks or feels like technology. Now consider John. John has early dementia. But John still goes online. And at one point, he placed order after order for Swiffer sweepers, right? He's also posting on Facebook. And he's checking in at certain places like the bank that you know, Alice is not sure he should be doing. So Alice is John's husband. And Alice steps in to take away his credit card, but she still wants him to be connected online. Now, Alice is a smart lady. She's fairly tech savvy. She has over a dozen accounts of her own, social media, health, banking. She sees what happens with her mother and her husband, and so she says to her children, why don't you just check in on me occasionally? You know, here are my login credentials. This is sort of the best we can do right now. Make sure I'm not doing anything odd with my banking or connecting with some unsavory characters on Facebook, right? So she's not ready to formally sign over power of attorney like her husband has done. So she's in this gray area. Now Alice's children are in their mid-60s. They're also older adults. So here we're talking about three generations of older adults. They want to connect with their, great, or their grandmother. They want to connect with their father but their grandmother doesn't use computers and their father often forgets who they are in his relationship to them. So my research is really about this question. How should we design technologies to enable people to stay socially active and engaged throughout their lives? And I'll also argue that as a society, we are drastically underprepared for what it means to age in the context of online technologies. So as we age, um, we're more likely to become socially isolated our networks begin to shrink and we naturally interact with fewer people. We may turn inward and look towards close social ties rather than expanding our network. There's also a relationship between social support in old age and physical and mental health. 
Those who are socially isolated may also have higher rates of disability, slower recovery from illness and early death. So there's a lot of reason to design for social interaction throughout the lifespan. Older adults who use the internet, for example, are less likely to feel depressed, socially isolated, or lonely. But a staggering 41% of older adults, and this data was collected only a couple years ago, were still offline. And what I mean by an older adult is the chronological age of 65. That's often how the World Health Organization um, categorizes older individuals. And disability is also related to lower rates of technology use. So these statistics are somewhat shocking. One in four people in the youngest bracket of what would be considered an older American has a severe communicative, cognitive, or physical disability. And then one in three older adults dies with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Right? So this is quite pervasive. It's an important issue that we need to think about as a field. And while these statistics are really motivating, they get a lot of students at least excited about designs and um, often funding agencies as well, they can encourage us to problematize aging. So we often design around helping people remember medications or prevent wandering behavior. This is really comfortable. A lot of us are computer scientists. We like to have a clearly um, laid out problem in front of us. We know what to design for and we know when we've reached a solution. And these are really important issues, but they're not the whole story. And they put growing older really in a fairly negative light. So a lot of my work follows from critical gerontology, right? And so we want to use design as a way of challenging these dominant narratives around aging. My work also um, draws on theories of distributed cognition. So in an information processing model of cognition, that places cognitive impairment on the particular individual. So it treats this individual as broken, as needing repair. So instead, if we look at cognition as distributed across people, space, time, and even our cultural practices, we can start to understand this system of activity and look at cognition as an emergent property of interaction and a process of meaning making in which the technologies we create participate. So the way I do my research is through an iterative human-centered design process. So I first start with extensive field research. So sorry, in the back you may not be able to read this. Um, we've conducted over 250 hours of observations at four different um, senior care facilities and interviews with over 100 older adults from a wide range of backgrounds, um, including many older adults with various disabilities. So based on that, we design and build new systems, often testing them for accessibility and appeal, running usability stu studies, and iteratively refining them. And then we often deploy these systems over the long term in the field, in, um, through field studies. And we're looking here at changing communication practices, maybe increased motivation to communicate or to be socially engaged, as well as independence in communication. Are you speaking up more in group conversation? Are you willing to participate in new ways? And then these new insights can help us understand, or the use of these systems can help us understand human social behavior and our communication practices in new ways. So to say it very simply, I consider myself an ethnographer who builds systems as a way of understanding the world. So today, my talk will span three different projects. And the first project involves designing new tools for social interaction among a family group. So this is a case study that focuses on this particular woman. You met her in the introduction. This is Ethel, and she was actually 105 at the time of this research. And the research study took place over the very last year of her life. So we began by observing and interviewing Ethel at one of our field sites. And we learned of this family's use of paper photos as a way of communicating with Ethel. So this is the wall in Ethel's room, and it looks a lot like the rooms of many other of the residents in this community. And what was interesting is the family described using the photos, pulling them off of the wall as a resource, and bringing them into conversation, and telling stories through the photographs. So now Ethel, at age 105, is also forgetting who people are and her relationship to them, right? But what's so fascinating about this is at 101, this is what her daughter said, Alice, when she went into the nursing home, she didn't want to interact with any of the people there. She considered them old. So being old is much more than a chronological age. It's much more about your perspective and your values. So we really saw an opportunity to enhance this sort of interaction and the storytelling happening through the photographs. So the idea of augmenting paper documents through things like, um, through media like audio, 
uh, is not at all new to the field of HCI. And we know that photographs can be powerful conversation aids. And enhancing photos with audio narrations or sounds can bring these images to life and enhance one's memory of events. And there are a number of related projects that do this, um, several of which use digital pen technology. Although there's a lot of work in this space, there really weren't any systems at the time that allowed end users to create their own audio enhanced paper materials. So for example, what I mean by an end user is a therapist able to customize paper-based therapy plans and augment that with audio for each individual client. Teachers creating interactive materials for early language learning. Or families, like the one I introduced here, enriching the experience of viewing printed photos. So we created the tap and play system to address this. And now I'll show you a quick demonstration video of how the system works. Tap and play is a pen and paper based interface for authoring multimedia documents. Start now. Circle. You can quickly link custom audio recordings to handle images on paper. You can use stickers with the dot pattern to make physical objects and other paper materials interactive. Coffee cup. Coffee cup. A full control panel allows you to customize audio playback regions, add audio recording buttons, and even regions that recognize handwriting. Square. Okay, so to give you a little bit more information about how this system works, you use the LiveScribe pen. This is custom software written for a pen that's a standalone device. It doesn't need to be connected to a computer via Bluetooth. It has an embedded processor, um, microphone, and speaker. And so you draw any sort of polygon on um, interactive dot pattern paper. And then you use this paper control panel to specify the type of action that you want to happen. So maybe this interactive space plays audio, records audio, or recognizes handwriting. Then you can couple that with customized interactions. So should this execute when you touch the pen to the paper, which a lot of the older adults here do, or should it be some sort of other gesture, single tap, double tap, something more complex? And then should this connect with a uh, new or existing resource or even be a pointer to another region? So something executes when you, it knows what to reference when you interact with this particular area. All of that is encapsulated in the idea of a region, stored in the document structure, and then we read and write to XML to share content across different pens. Now, getting to this final system was, uh, it took at least two years, right? So I'm showing you the final polished thing here, but this started out with um, a longer term study of speech language therapy for adults who were recovering from stroke. And the therapist really wanted to create customized interactive paper materials. So we created first versions of this, introduced it into the field through a pilot deployment, and then learned that there was a lot that needed to be improved. It took about 20 minutes to author basic activities, which was not practical at all from a therapist's perspective. So we revised the system, really uh, streamlined it, and got that down to about five minutes. And then, based on this, um, this authoring system we had, we learned of many other contexts in which people were wanting to create these sort of custom interactive paper activities. As I said, early childhood education and for family social communication. And so we deployed this system in four contexts with over 100 people. So today I'll just tell you about one deployment. And this is with Ethel and her family. And her family came around her and created an interactive photo album for her 105th birthday. Here you can see interaction across five generations of her family where even young children were able to walk up and use and record audio in the album. So we provided the family with photos printed on dot pattern paper, interactive stickers that they could add to greeting cards from her birthday or printed photos from her birthday party, and assemble, and this really allowed them to assemble the album in the ways that they desired. So this became an evolving family artifact. And the medium of audio really allowed for rich descriptions of family photos. So here's just one example from Ethel's youngest daughter. I remember this day very vividly in my mind. I can smell, still smell the pine cones. I can remember the water. I can remember us standing and taking that picture. I don't remember a lot about my childhood, but this I do remember. This is Ruthie. And so this was tied to this photo from the 1940s of Ethel and all of her children. 
So Alice is Ethel's closest family member. She checks on her mother daily, and she really took on the role of album curator. So what's interesting here is Alice went through the community, took photos of people who care for her mother, had them describe what they do and when they see their, her mother, and add them to the book. So Alice is a smart woman. She knows that if her mother um, calls her caregivers by name, she might actually get better care. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting here is the, the family received very little guidance from us as the research team about how to author the photo album. So again, as it, as it becomes this evolving artifact, we can look at it to understand best practices for creating this sort of media. So for example, the family often um, called, this, called these talking pictures, where when you tap on someone's head, that's the region that's speaking or the area that's speaking to you. The family also did this really interesting thing of grouping photos by relationship because that's the aspect of interaction that Ethel um, was struggling with the most or had the most challenge remembering particular who people were and her relationship to them. And so it allows for this physical layering of photos over time, which you could kind of scroll through and hear the same message from this great grandson of hers. Then another really interesting thing is that the family used this to joke with one another. Here are Ethel's four children with her. And they teased each other, saying, I'm the best daughter, right? And so you have this layering of audio messages back and forth between a particular family that's, a, that's really revealing of this dynamic. So when we look at what the family did with this, so we gave it to them for six weeks. We took a first baseline assessment, and then this was after um, five months of use. Alice created the bulk of the messages. So 104 messages, Alice created 46 of those messages. This diagram over here um, represents Ethel's family tree with her four children and four generations of her descendants. And what we looked for, we had two, multiple coders go through each audio file and look for features. The size of the circle represents how many messages were created, and the darkness represents how many features were per message. So for example, um, if it had nine different aspects of information, actually there were a couple that had that, um, it might be a very long and complex message. But a number of the messages discussed relationships, included markers of time for Ethel, identified where it was taken, or the location of the photo. But most of the messages, especially those created by Alice, the person who you could argue knows her mother and knows what interaction should be like with her the best, contain three things. She always identified herself, even though she sees her mother daily. Said, this is Alice, your daughter, and provided one single piece of information. So this can help inspire and guide design for similar sorts of media. Now, after the first six weeks, we surveyed Ethel's close family members and nursing staff. And so people reported improvements in the quality of conversations they had with Ethel, Ethel's interest in socializing with other people, as well as along individual dimensions of happiness, responsiveness, alertness, and willingness to interact with other people. One surprising finding is that um, people said that Ethel's range of motion might be improving because now here's someone who is sitting most of her day, and now she's reaching out and tapping on a page, right? So something um, we certainly did not expect. Now this was six weeks. At the end of the study, after five months, we interviewed Ethel's family members and friends and they started saying things like this. Remember this is an N of one study, it's, a, it's just a case study, so we don't know. But it was pretty compelling still. At 105, Alice was saying things like, she doesn't point to the bulletin board anymore because Alice took all those pictures that she didn't know off and added context around them in the book, that her, nurses was, her nurse was saying, um, she will show me family pictures on the wall and tell me who they are, and she never did that before. Right, so we're seeing improvement at 105, that perhaps the process of revisiting these photos and that rich audio information coupled with it could be useful, even at the very end of life. So why was this case successful? I'd argue for two reasons. One is that Ethel used this album during the very last part of her life, and her daughter said, it's bringing back the past. And these are very happy memories. And it was very successful in engaging Ethel. Um, at one moment, we were, uh, at one point, we were taking the album back from the family. And they said, you can't take it back. You know, <laughs> we don't watch TV anymore. We do the book, you know. And so Alice, is, uh, Alice actually tried at one point to put photos on her iPad and bring them to her mother. And her mother said, I don't want that. Put them in the book. <laughs> right. And so this was sort of the, the surprising finding at the end of the study that, okay, maybe this works um, for certain people who aren't as um, interested in the types of photo sharing that we're doing. Um, the other bigger thing here is that 
this tool, the, the system had the right level of abstraction and ease of use that allowed a family of older adults to be the creators of content that would engage their mother. So that's something really um, important in terms of a takeaway for our future work. It's about giving the right kinds of tools to empower older adults themselves as creators and filling that particular social need. Okay, so although I'd argue that case was successful for particular reasons, Ethel actually only appeared in seven of the audio recordings, and she really wasn't front and center in creating this content. So we wanted to look at what does this mean? What, is, what might it mean for an individual with cognitive impairment to be empowered and to be actively engaged in creating content? So I'm going to describe some of our work in art therapy. So it's specifically, this is art therapy with adults with dementia. Now, over five million people in the U.S. have dementia, which is marked by a significant decline in cognition, and it affects memory and language. But society tends to view dementia as a complete decline, right? It's really scary for a lot of us to think about it as a loss of abilities. Some, is, some people have even described dementia as the eroding of the self, leaving only a body to be managed, right? That paints a very bleak picture. In contrast to that, the practice of art therapy is all about providing clients with a sense of dignity. They're positioned as capable and competent artists. It's about empowering people through creation and sharing their artwork, and helping people connect with other people through the act of making and sharing. So our research in this context involves over two years of field research. We supplemented this, in, this is in a um, skilled nursing and assisted um, living facility, particularly within the memory care center of that. And we've also supplemented this with interviews with 13 additional art therapists. So at HCI, we often try to find ways to enable users to have a voice in the design process, in both research and design. And art therapy really provides a model of how to achieve this with adults with dementia. For example, the therapist was saying, when you're having a creative interaction with somebody, you're not bound by the normal linear conversation. You don't even necessarily have to be able to speak coherently to be able to express yourself creatively. So the social rules that we have that prize logic and reasoning become less important. Sensory experiences, humor, emotional awareness, and creativity are all valued. And they, those aspects of living last long into the course of dementia. But making and sharing in this context really depends on the facilitating role of the art therapist. She says her goal is to have an effective third hand, to be the third hand like machinery, to make the physical work happen. With this, she fades into the background. Being the third hand involves employing your abilities in the empathetic service of other people. And so the therapist really provides a model of how to do this. And she's supporting people when she reacts to comments like this. I'd like nothing better than to be able to walk or even move by myself without a million people helping me. Right? So it's all about the therapist enabling and empowering without overhelping, as overhelping can have the, have the opposite effect. And so we really want to reflect on how systems can act like the third hand, helping in just the right ways without overstepping and fading into the background, being fluid and dynamic in that interaction. The therapist also plays a really important role in ne negotiating, sharing these experiences sharing these expressions and negotiating privacy. So we view privacy as a dialectic, the ongoing negotiation of access to the self and others. But the concept of privacy and how we manage it is far more complex. We often have collectively held privacy boundaries because this information is not just about ourselves, and privacy boundaries change over the lifespan. And you can look at this as a caregiver and care recipient. Their activities become more intertwined. And they're both responsible for um, managing these boundaries and, and negotiating uh, access to information. So throughout our field work, we identified four areas in which sharing occurs. So in individual therapy, it could be just that dyadic interaction where someone is revealing very personal needs or experiences through their artwork. Or it could be in group therapy. We've observed sessions that's about the topic of making art around love. What does love mean to you? When was the last relationship you've had? Right? But then two other areas of sharing came up as well. One is 
what we call um, through surrogacy, or the way in which a therapist will share on behalf of the individual to members of their care team, their physicians, the nurses, as well as their family members. And the other is through public art exhibitions. And this, these often serve as a way of um, being a voice for the experience of dementia. So older adults with dementia will often put their art in exhibits as a way of sort of challenging um, uh, societal views around dementia. But what's challenging here is that these are the two spaces in which the individual could connect the most or has the most opportunity to connect with their family members and friends, but they have the least amount of influence over the sharing process. For example, the uh, individual has very little say over which items and how they're shared in care plan meetings. And if they wish to share their work in a public gallery, but their authorized representative says no, they're not able to. So I'll just pause for one moment. You may be wondering why we should study art therapy at all. What does this context provide? First is about this, the argument around staying socially connected and that artwork can facilitate social communication in new ways with family and friends. The second is that this is a protected health context. It involves personal health information. So it's subject to health information privacy laws, so HIPAA here in the United States. And it allows studying privacy and sharing as a social practice for vulnerable populations. So we can examine these collectively held privacy boundaries and understand how privacy boundaries change over the lifespan and are negotiated through this object that serves as both part of the health record and an expressive artifact. So what we've been doing is introducing new tools to understand this negotiation. So we've created an interactive frame that has an Android tablet and um, in, this is a very first version of the prototype, has configurable paper buttons that the therapist could use with a client. And the goal here was to record audio narrations going along with artwork. So here the therapist is capturing a piece of artwork and they're recording some audio. And it's all controlled by my handy wizard over here, which some of you may know. Um, <laughs> So in doing this, this first exploration, we really learned that, that the older adults we're studying here in art therapy have something they want to share. They often have stories they want to share, or they want to connect with people through their artwork. But the meaning and the purpose of the artwork is far more important than the actual artifact. And a lot of our sharing systems to date are very artifact-centric. It's about a particular image that is spreadable online, rather than the meaning and the purpose surrounding it and that interpretation. And then these sort of rich art, multimodal artifacts, the artwork coupled with audio, are part of their communication system. So for example, one resident's uh, picture looked like this green amorphous shape. But if you had the audio to go along with it, you'd realize she'd been talking about the green dress that she wore when she got married. So suddenly it's communicating a lot more than you thought. And these artifacts become very important. Although it's the process of creation and that interpretation, the artifacts themselves become very important to the family members. They're these prized possessions that the families negotiate ownership over, which to me is pretty surprising. Um, and it's especially important to think about the limited role that these individuals have in gifting their artifacts. Currently, it's not very much. So we're thinking about ways of supporting new forms of, pri of um, online social sharing or gifting artwork for individuals with dementia. But concepts like privacy, what are friends online, and Facebook groups are um, pretty abstract. So we're experimenting with a variety of physical prototypes. For example, um, a sharing circle that uses physical space as a way of bringing people in and out to indicate your desires to share with them. Or a scrapbook to provide contextual or biographical information that might help you connect with certain people in your life through the artwork. Or even physical props. This is an ear and a microphone. So an ear might be that you whisper something to someone or a microphone to make sure that you're loud, your voice is loud and it's bold and it's meant for public consumption. Turns out things like the microphone and the sharing circle or the use of physical space worked fairly well. So building on this, we created what we call the moment system. And the point of this system is to provide a set of resources for the therapist and client to negotiate desires around sharing. So it works with the top codes tagging system. This is a paper-based computer vision tagging system where you can print out little codes and attach them to physical objects. So the therapist here included things like a lock or a treasure box that said, just for me. 
And so when this is brought into interaction around this portfolio of work, that can be labeled as this information is just for me. And so what's important here is the therapist can really customize these physical supports for that particular individual. And just by bringing them into interaction, they can then have meaning in the digital, alongside the digital representation. And so we saw the therapist customize um, this set of resources in various ways. For example, making a photo address book, right? So the therapist can also, in addition to um, configuring different audiences, like a specific person to my husband or a general group to my family or to anyone who wants to see it, that was one of the options. The therapist can also add actions. For example, you can bring in um, a, a note card, an envelope or a postcard, and when that's brought in and scanned by the system, that could execute sending an email to a family member or whoever was tagged or brought in alongside it. So now, we, one promising scenario we have learned about throughout this project is the idea of publishing to a blog. So let's take this example as a thought exercise. This is by no means perfect, but I think it's important for us to consider. So, for example, bringing in a certain object would then post or publish this to perhaps a Tumblr blog. Right. right. And this is something we have parts of this working, but we're really struggling with how to make this interaction work in, um, yeah, in, in multiple ways. So maybe having a closed password protected blog is enough. Um, there are a lot of ethical and legal considera considerations around the contextual shift once you're leaving the healthcare context. But do we need approval mechanisms in here? Right now, an individual is not allowed to share beyond the therapeutic context without uh, approval from their authorized representative. So how might this approval process work? What are the trade-offs in giving more power to the legal represent representative and instantiating it in the system in that way? OK, so these are some of the questions that we're really grappling with. Now, building our work in art therapy, we started to question and want to understand the role that caregivers are playing in online activity. So I'll briefly present a focus group study that looks at the role of caregivers in the online lives of adults with cognitive impairment. So I'll start with the experience of one study participant. So Jane's the primary caregiver for her husband, who she says suffers from aphasia. It's mostly communication challenges, but memory is affected when your brain is working on aphasia. She says, I'm very aware of his, you know, when he comes and goes, sort of his level of coherence, especially when he's interacting with technology. So Jane encourages him to go online and keep in touch with his family members and friends and look up information about his hobbies. But she said recently he had his identity stolen, and they knew about it because someone tried to take out a mortgage. So they talked about the internet. Despite this unfortunate event, she still wants him to be active and engaged online, right? So this is very curious to us. And so far, so far the literature has really focused on the physical, emotional, social, and financial stress associated with caregiving. But online technology presents a new set of considerations. In HCI, we often work on solving problems related to remote caregiving or preventing wandering behavior, as I mentioned before. But no research had previously looked at the caregiver's role in online interaction, specifically for people with cognitive impairment. So to address this gap in the literature, we conducted focus groups with 20 informal caregivers. So these were all family caregivers, full-time, unpaid. Um, you can see that the caregiver's age skews slightly younger, and the care recipient's age is slightly older, many of whom are older adults. And the care recipients um, experience cognitive impairment from a variety of conditions, such as Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia from stroke, um, or brain injury from an accident. So using a constructivist grounded theory, we identified four <coughs> forms of work that caregivers were performing. Guiding, stimulating, connecting, and protecting. And today I'll talk about just two of those forms of work. But first I want to give you a little bit of um, a, a taste of the experience of what it means to support someone in online activity. So caregivers describe their role as support that really comes and goes, watching over their care recipient's shoulder and stepping in when needed. You know, John said, back then they were really independent. Everyone had their own judgment. They didn't need someone looking over their shoulder, making sure what they were doing was in their best interest. So now you have a second person weighing in, deciding if what you are doing is in your best interest, is okay behavior. 
But this is really difficult. So caregivers emphasize the changing nature of cognitive impairment. It's day to day and sometimes even moment to moment. People would describe a care recipient being um, very active online most days, but occasionally they would walk in and find the person staring blankly at the computer, not sure what happened or what to do next. So as Edward said, it's more like a zigzag than one direction. So we can't just design systems to support at one moment in time, right? Again, this is about the third hand. We don't want to restrict people's ability to interact to their, uh, to their full extent of their abilities. We want to support them in that, but do so in a way that allows caregivers to step in when needed. Caregivers is, is one of the forms of work is connecting. So caregivers see it as very important to keep care recipients socially connected online. And social media may even help people remember and keep your memory hanging by, by a thread, sort of like the audio enhanced photo album could have done for Ethel, or at least it suggested that's what was happening. But caregivers post on behalf of care recipients and even tag them in posts so they feel included online. Caregivers do a lot to help connect them online and facilitate social relationships, even if the caregiver doesn't want them to. For example, this was somewhat of a contentious post. Nancy said she posts about things like, Daddy went outside today, or Daddy was able to dress himself, or Daddy was in diapers. And we said, Nancy, you know, what, what, how does your father react to this? She said, oh, he doesn't know. He would not like that. Right, so she is expressing a need for support from her network to say, this is what I'm going through as a caregiver. But at the same time, she's revealing very sensitive and personal information about her father, who is also online. So here, I mean, the, the key insight is that caregivers actually want their care recipients to be active online, and they're doing things to make them feel included and connected. But at times, this is, uh, causes tension with their own need for social support and reaching out to their networks. The other form of work that I'll mention today is this idea of protecting. So caregivers are stepping in to protect their care recipients. They filter and remove distressing content. For example, um, we heard many stories where a care recipient would come across a distressing news story and they would, it, it would significantly impact them emotionally and even physically to, to the point of shaking. But they would do this over and over and over again, the same news story, not realizing they've already seen that content. And so caregivers are stepping in to remove this distressing content. They're also filtering what other family members say about them under this idea of protecting them, right? So sometimes caregivers had to remove other posts. And the thing that's clear here is that caregivers really lack the tools and the knowledge to do the sorts of filtering that they desire. So they're developing these workarounds. They're sharing passwords and they're setting up email filters. These are quite suboptimal um, solutions for this very delicate uh, sort of work that they're doing. Caregivers are also cleansing friend lists. This sort of surprised me. They're going in deleting and defriending people. Um, some felt that it was not their role to do that and they would just do damage control and deal with it after if something bad happened, right? These are adults. These are people who have lived a long life and now they have someone coming in and making decisions on their behalf. It's very clear that our systems are not designed to support these complex social relationships and these transitions in vulnerability throughout the lifespan. Okay, so drawing on this study, if we come back to this idea of what does it mean to enable someone, um, especially someone with significant cognitive impairment, to be active and engaged online, and being active and engaged means sharing and contributing online, right? So caregivers may actually want to filter information going to the person with cognitive impairment, but is this ethical from the older adult's <coughs> perspective, right? Whose agencies matter here? And then who owns the content? Who should modify it? What about retweeting or reposting? There are a lot of tensions that we learned about, about family members oversharing and sharing things out of context, right? So there are a lot of open questions here, and the point is to get you thinking about them and to use design as a way of reflecting on and understanding some of the nuances in sharing and privacy, particularly for vulnerable individuals around health, financial, and social information online. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you of the complexities of designing for late life social interaction. So now I'll conclude with just a few remarks about what I think this means in terms of challenges for the field and going forward. 
So the field of HCI, we're beginning to realize that full participation in society involves staying active and engaged online, and that sharing online is a central aspect of this. But this requires shifting how we view the experience of growing older. Older adulthood is a time of development and growth, not disability and social isolation being the dominant narrative. So we need tools that foster engagement, creativity, and self-expression, like Yvonne Rogers' work on Makey Makey. We've recently been looking at older adult bloggers, bloggers who contribute online as a way of negotiating their identity in older adulthood. Bloggers who are talking about social issues such as ageism, talking about how age discrimination starts at age 50, <coughs> right? Talking about how things um, like intimacy and relationships uh, aren't even on the radar for people to consider in older adulthood because they're so taboo. So looking at what being active and engaged online means can open up some new ideas for design. We've also been looking at older adults as um, uh, crowd workers, what, what it means for an older individual and what opportunities are there for doing online work. Um, but to enable this sort of participation, I'm arguing that we need authoring and creation and, publish, and publishing tools that have the right level of abstraction and that really build on familiar communication practices and our social practices, um, or I'm sorry, familiar communication interfaces and the social practices that correspond. So I shared a couple of these projects with you today. The other one that we're working on involves um, voice-based interfaces for um, older adults who are blind or low vision, who don't use computers, but who are seeking community. And so these older adults are blogging through their landline phone. So this is a landline or a feature phone, and they're contributing content online, and they're forming a community around their shared experience. So that's some of the ongoing work we have. And then these new tools allow us to study phenomena of online behavior in, with entirely new demographics and in new ways. So for example, systems often conceptualize privacy and information sharing as fairly individualistic. But we clearly are seeing how these decisions involve multiple stakeholders. And this also raises the need for privacy models that support these sorts of negotiations across contexts. So here, the idea of artwork is both an expressive communication artifact as well as part of the health record, speaks to those contextual shifts and how we need to um, go about understanding privacy in that, in that space. And finally, um, we can further understand the cooperative negotiation of privacy, how others weigh in on, the, on risks, how legal frameworks and ethical attunement by a therapist, for example, influence individual behavior. For example, if you weren't allowed to share or publish online without the permission of another person, an authorized representative, but you've been doing this your entire life, what does that mean? <coughs> right. And then finally, with these sorts of insights, um, I'd argue we can start building new, form, new types of systems. And so these systems need to really move beyond the single user account model and allow for things like surrogacy and information stewards. And this um, definitely fits in with a lot of Sarita Yardi, uh, Schoenbeck and Jed Brubaker's work. Um, and it's thinking about privacy models that understand contextual shifts and relationships, as well as transitions and vulnerability across the lifespan. So, We've talked, you know, a lot of the work looks at young children or um, end of life or even the afterlife and how other people come alongside them. When I was sharing this work recently with a close colleague of mine, she said, um, Anne Marie, I had foot surgery not long ago. I was on opioids for eight weeks. She said, I have no memory of what I did. But all I know is I keep getting boxes of clothes shipped to the house. I agreed to book chapters. I agreed to give talks. And I have no memory. And she said, there's no way for my husband to sort of check in on me and make sure what I'm doing is in my best interest. It's like, I, you know, this is, a big, this is a big deal, so beware. Um, but um, that sort of, I think, speaks to the relevance of this challenge across the lifespan and at, and at very unexpected times. So with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators and I'm happy to take questions. Uh -huh. Thank you, I really, really enjoy your talk, and especially when you were having the flavor of blending the physical and also the digital part to support the uh, older adults and also um, kind of um, 
bring the existing technology and take it to the level of right level of abstraction. And they have two questions. So the first one is, in the first two projects, you use photos and also art therapy. Both are so fascinating. And I'm wondering, at the very beginning, when you start to investigate, launching to the project, mm -hmm. how did you get the inspiration? Especially, I understand there are ethnographic studies, mm -hmm. um, but I think there's probably one step before. Did you uh, like um, stay with the older adults for some time, or uh, did you get some advice from the experts or uh, from the literature? I'm uh -huh. wondering, like, the, at okay. the very beginning, how did you start with the, investigating those media? That's the first question. Okay, maybe let's let's take that one first then. Yes. I think it's all of those things, right? So as you're reading and you're looking at the related work, as you're in the field and you look at people's practices, you're sort of overwhelmed by this. But then you're right. I mean, the, the common thing here is the visual medium as well as coupled with the audio. And it's it's partially because that the persistence of that visual and having a physical artifact has been very important to a lot of the older adults we're working with. Right? But then having the nuanced richness of voice. Voice is so emotional, just like penmanship or writing, right? These things have a personal signature to them. And and I think that's that's this idea of blending um, familiar communication interfaces with social practices and values, right? And so there's a lot of value around voice-based communication for the older adults we work with. That's why we're doing this phone-based blogging study, right? It's because communicating by voice um, or calling someone on the phone is a very important social practice for many older adults still. Did you want to ask your second? There's one in the back. Okay, maybe others can go first. Can okay. You? Let me follow up on that because one of the things that I've noticed <clears throat> among my older friends is the prevalent of use of stuff like Skype and WhatsApp and FaceTime and so forth, particularly for cross-generational communication. Mm -hmm. The one thing that sometimes frustrates them are the user interfaces. So I'm wondering if your group or, or others are, are aware of work, uh, you know, the same way that you have those stupid old-fashioned phones with much larger buttons, whether there's any work on, on you know, for people in their 70s, it may not be as bad, but later on, I've seen people deeply frustrated. Younger people get frustrated by it, too. Yes, yeah, so um, some of the key people doing work in that space are Vicki Hansen at, um, and uh, Ron Becker, both of their labs. Um, and, and, you know, the other space, if you want to go to for um, uh, more user, very concrete user interface design recommendations um, is, is more along the lines of human factors researchers. So um, Sarah Shaja at the University of Miami, Neil Charnas at Florida State, and Wendy Rogers at Georgia Tech. So there are a lot of people who are studying that aspect of, of designing for older populations. Thank you. Um, so yeah, first of all, I really enjoyed your talk. Have you considered older adults who live in isolation, who can't afford um, to be in a caretaking capacity or an environment? Um, for them, like the physical, uh, the physical social isolation is very extreme. For those in specific individuals, um, have you, um, do you know, or have you considered these kind of methods and assistive technologies that can? Help, help that specific group in the um, secluded population of older adults to be more engaging with other people. Yes, um, so that the um, voice-based blogging study is specifically for seniors living alone in their own homes right now. And um, that, even just sort of the, the intake data when we study like perceptions of connectedness and social isolation and uh, quality of life, you know, taking those sorts of measures, um, I can't help but be very kind of emotional about it. It's, it's actually a, a very big challenge, right, for people living on their own. And so I think designing technologies that are very low cost, because it, it's quite expensive to live in a care community, right? And so you have disparity there that we need to think about in, in the technologies we're designing. And so I think the voice-based stuff we're doing is, um, is incredibly low cost. It's a couple cents a call that we, you know, pick up as the research team. But they use their existing hardware, right? Um, they can access it from anywhere they have a phone, which is very 
still very common. Mm -hmm. um, just a follow-up statement. I, I ask this because um, in South Korea, we have one of the <coughs> most modernized um, technological infrastructure, but uh, a very severe aging population of older adults who live alone. And, uh, and, it's, and the current assistive technology focuses on like delivering meals, delivering yeah. certain phys physical needs, but it kind of ignores the conversation around keeping these people um, included in society, like having that sort of interaction. And a lot of the interaction, online interaction is dominated by younger generations. Um, uh, a lot of the social media applications as well, so it's particularly very meaningful and interesting to hear um, the work that's being done. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? We're going to happy hour now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I want to, uh, uh, thanks, this is great. And I want to just ask you to speculate a little bit, or maybe? Okay. Um, one of the things you were talking about, um, trying, was it Ethel uh, in the first? 105, yes. Yeah. <laughs> who didn't want to look at pictures on a tablet or on, yeah. on that. And there's a tendency, I think, to sort of say, oh, well, that'll go away as we start getting into the born digital de generations yep. or whatever. Can you just speculate on sort of which of the aspects of this that are, of a, you know that you're seeing in this that are you think are really going to be continue to be important? Are there aspects you think are going to change as you get different generations? Right. Aging? So that is the question. If you work with older adults, that is the question. Are there cohort differences or age-related differences? Right. So a cohort difference is going to be the next generation of older adults. They're all on Facebook. They know how to use Skype and. Um, you know, the, the practices around using communication technology are fundamentally different than, say, the current oldest old. Um, so that's, that's one issue to think about. And I, don't, I think we, only time will tell, right, whether other things like certain forms of communication become very important towards the end of life. We know from, from a lot of uh, Laura Carstensen's work at Stanford, right, about socio-emotional selectivity theory, where our goals actually change as we perceive the end of life to be near. We're less interested in reaching out to other people. We might turn inward towards close personal connections. So only time will tell whether future generations will rely on different meaningful forms of communication. So that's part of it. The other part is, as the gentleman in the back brought up, is there are certain aspects of aging that you know, are, are pretty pervasive. No matter how many Sudoku puzzles you do, or no matter how much <laughs> carrot juice you drink, whatever it is, right? Like, we, we age, and that's just part of it. And I think so. there's a piece that will always be there in terms of accessibility of these tools. So it's, it's a two-sided question. I think that is the question that we need to pay attention to over the next few years. Um, one thing that's related to that is I found uh, my work at sort of a, a transition point where we're no longer as concerned, despite a lot of older adults still being offline, we're less concerned about helping people get online for the first time than we are designing tools that allow you to stay active and engaged throughout the lifespan. Right, so that's a big shift that's happening right now. So you can look at the literature and see see that. Um, thank you, though, for the good question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in the beginning uh, of the talk, you said you are um, ethnographer that uses system to understand the elders. But how do you um, shift yourself or accommodate your ethnographic research when this user population you're studying might be deteriorating and declining? And you might not be getting as much as valid information as you go along your journey of our research and studying, or get, even getting your good notes. Okay, there's a lot in that question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so as part of an ethnographic approach, I'm not actually looking to sort of say, when I started in the field, it's the same, or I'm looking for some change over time in, a, in that sense. I'm looking for evolving practices over time. Um, so the, the harder part, the reality of it, is that we often do have participants pass away. And that's very sad. And it's, it's truly, because you, when you're at a field site for over two years with these people, and you, you know, I, it, some of these sessions will bring you to tears, the things that people are saying are important to them, and how they're especially communicating through their artwork. And then you show up the next week, and they're no longer there. Um, the therapist herself says she often has to go and make art just to process what's happened and to deal with that sort of relationship and the change. So that's just a hard part of, of doing longer-term ethnography with this particular group of people. 
Um, but I think it depends. So, so when I say I'm an ethnographic researcher who builds systems to understand the way the world works, it's that we're not really looking at like a pre-post, for example, pre-intervention, post-intervention, but we're looking at how people make use of these tools and bring them into their practice or not. Right, so for example, Ethel and her family not wanting to give back the photo album is one example of that. We have certainly created tools, I didn't present them today, that people didn't want to use, right? And so, so use over time is one indicator of that. Um, but really it's about the evolution of those tools and we try to create these open-ended authoring systems so that people can appropriate them and tweak them in the ways that fit their practice and then we can better understand their practice through concepts like privacy and, and disclosure. Does that help? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, one more. Yeah, I'm just curious. I'm wondering throughout your studies, did you ever notice any patterns of like people, older people, who just caught on immediately a lot easier with technologies compared to others? And just because I, I was just thought, mm -hmm. is there some like ingrained kind of cognitive skills or patterns of thinking that enable people to catch on to these things quicker than others, irrespective of if they have a cognitive disability or not? So your questions around whether I've encountered certain older participants yeah. who quickly catch on to technology? Yeah. Um, yeah. One of my favorite is, um, and I think she's in her mid 80s. She's such an interesting case. Who? I mean, she's a programmer, right? She's like, I don't have internet in my home because I don't feel that that's an appropriate use of my home space. I want my home to be private. But I go to the internet and hear all of my books, and uh, you know, I'm actively programming and and um, doing. Um, uh, you know, contributing in this way to the library. So she's actually, she's very active, right? And she's very technical, but she has certain values as well around communication technology. So it's not just that we can say like, how quickly will someone adopt technology or are they really good at it right away? None of us are really good. I mean, I, I walked around Disneyland right here and let my phone die because I couldn't figure out how to turn it off. This was in 2007 with the very first iPhone. I had no idea how to turn it off, right? And so it's, it's not very useful to look at that, that initial learning that happens. It's more useful to look at sort of over time and how people are um, either sticking with technology, creating their own technologies. So um, I think it's, it's a fair question, right? Um, I'd have to say, unfortunately, I see a lot more the other side of it, where people, we often volunteer in um, uh, computer centers as well for older adults, and where people will come in week after week asking that we set up a Gmail account for them. So well, we set it up last week, here's your password, right? And, and it's, it's very, that, that's a very real experience. So it's much more of the consistent learning over time rather than, um, seeing a whole lot of like jumping to technology really quickly. And I share the embarrassing story of myself because we're all guilty of not understanding like features on first glance or how technology works. So. Uh -huh. I'm not trying to keep piling on the questions, <laughs> uh, but I would like to pile on the compliments. It's a very nice talk. Thank you. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, the role, potential roles of music? Uh, either creating or yeah. listening in yeah. what you're doing? So music therapy is also a big area. I know we have a few people with clinical backgrounds in here, and that's something that I'm interested in. We've been sticking with the visual arts for now, but I think music therapy, um, again, there's something about, especially for um, cognitive impairment or dementia, where the arts allow, I was talking with the students about this at lunch, the arts allow for a freedom of expression that's you know, that's, that's really important. They don't require rationality. It's all about interpretation. And so there's no expectation that what you're producing is the right thing, right? And so in that way, you can use things like music or the visual arts, performance arts, movement, um, to really position people as active and engaged and to, to view their activity as meaningful. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a really important area in that future work, maybe. What do, you, do you have particular thoughts about music? Um, well, more questions, okay. I guess, in this regard. Uh, the idea, for example, uh, bringing pictures to life musically, mm. uh, making musical pictures kind of a thing. I mean, okay. you, know, like you showed the idea of, of, if you will, voice and images. Yeah. And so just kind of riffing on that to can images start to sing? Uh, can they have songs associated with them okay. or rhythms or whatever? And, 
is, you know, because these are ideas of environmental enrichment, which, you know, other people are looking at as, as being things that can stimulate mm -hmm. uh, uh, memory recovery, memory development, long-term memory potentiation and the like. Absolutely. It can stimulate memory, but it also is a tremendous source of empowerment. So one example I'm thinking of is one of the participants in art therapy has Parkinson's disease, and prior to that, she was an accomplished musician, right? And so she has a lot of recordings of her playing, but now with the Parkinson's, she can't. Um, and a lot of people in the community remember her sitting in common spaces playing. So what the therapist did actually with the, the live scribe pen was couple her um, pieces, her um, prior recordings to her visual artwork and presented that as part of an art exhibition. And to see her experience that, to see her say it's coming alive through the music and that this is very gratifying and that it's very healing for her to see this. The therapist said these are things you work years for a person to be able to articulate, that this could be a healing experience. And so I think music, especially for people who identify as a musician or for that, that was a big part of their life, this can be incredibly important. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I agree. It's, not, lim soapbox, it's not limited sorry. to people with musicianship. I mean, there is a quite a bit of research that says that um, uh, people who've had mm -hmm. uh, some form of music education earlier in their life who never practice, who mm -hmm. never play, have these long-term cognitive uh, benefits and capabilities. So when you learned how to play piano in the first grade for a year or so and hated it for the rest <laughs> of your life, it will come back and pay off in the end. You won't be able to play the piano, but you'll have higher cognitive performance, at least is what some of the current research is showing. That's interesting. I haven't seen that come up in the field, but I'll be aware of that. I really like that angle. Thank you. Um, and then mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, dance therapy. What are, you, what are your thoughts about bringing uh, physical <laughs> movement? I think you and I need to collaborate. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's very interesting talk and very good conversations. And I suggest us to move outside. We have food and drink outside and continue talk uh, with Anne Marie about this. Her.